It's my honor of the, on behalf of the organizers to introduce our honorary honor keynote speaker, Anna Lohenhaut-Tin, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of Santa Cruz of California and a new spoke professor in the Department of Culture and Society at Aarhus University in Denmark. The Vienna Conference of the Finnish Anthropological Society this year uh, focuses on the topic of landscape, sociality and materiality. This topic was composed as a collective effort by the University of Helsinki Anthropologists who have done research on human nature relations in different corners of the world for many years now, uh, as Katja just earlier noted. This topic was not, is not new in the anthropological literature. In the 1990s, some anthropologists explored landscape as a socio-cultural process through which material, natural and human life become entangled with each other in particular ways in the specific places. In the beginning of the 1990s, Anne Ting published her ethnographic description on Miraculous Mountains in Kalimantan that entitled The Realm of the Diamond Queen, Marginality in and Out of the Way. In, in which forest landscape was profoundly social, and I quote, the forest they showed me was a terrain of personal biography and community history. In the following ethnographic book, entitled Friction, published in 2005, she explored global connections, universalism such as capitalism and environmental activism that were brought to the Meratus Mountains and Kalimantan by the state agencies capitalistic corporations and environmental NGOs. It was a study of uneasy encounters between different actors uh, in this faraway place and how these encounters produce sometimes misunderstandings and what she called friction. Here landscape is social, it includes humans and nature, and it is a site of both destruction and creation of wild empty spaces. It could be called frontier landscape. The change that takes place in the landscape is produced not only by nature, but even more, even more so by humans. In this sense, it is a truly anthropogenic landscape. As an anthropologist who conducts research in Kalimantan, which is deeply wounded and disrupted by different corporations, state development projects, and by, and by human-caused environmental catastrophes such as forest fires, I can only thank her for giving us these theoretical and ethnographic contributions on landscape formation. Today, we will hear about her new research that continues and redirects her earlier theoretical and ethnographic contributions. It, continue, it, uh, it concerns our damaged planet and how to understand it as an anthropocene. Let me welcome our distinguished guest. It is a great, great pleasure to have Anna Tsin here with her talk, The Bug, the Bug, and the Dream of the Stack, Some un Unexpected Weeks. Thank you so much, and it's a real pleasure and an honor to get to address you today. I was especially excited to come to this conference because of the theme, Landscape, and I'm very much looking forward to the panels. Landscape is an exciting object of analysis for anthropologists for many intertwined reasons, and I'll get to a few of them later. For the moment, let me start with just one. A landscape angle makes new kinds of collaborations possible across the divide between social and natural science, and these are urgent to know in the human messed up world. Exploring such collaboration is one of the goals of the program I co-direct in Denmark Aarhus University Research on the Anthropocene, or AURA. We have a joint research site in Central Jutland, a former ground coal mine, and we play together across disciplines to explore that new landscape. In this talk, I make my own first rather tentative foray into discussing this site, and very much informed by the whole team's continuing research. The gift for you is that this is rough thoughts in process, and of course, that's the terrible danger, too. I look forward to your comments and your suggestions. My opening slide shows Roaring Stag by a Lake, a well-known Danish genre painting. In Denmark, stag paintings, once ubiquitous, are still common. I saw my first one on a real estate brochure. The image seeds with proud but vulnerable masculine authority. 
it lures viewers to the chase. I will call that, that lure the dream of the stag. And while not the whole topic of my talk, it will be its guiding trope. I have two purposes for the dream of the stag, and I'll try and keep both going. First, I'll tell of real stags and hunters as these help me understand weedy landscapes. <coughs> Coordinations across human and non-human projects, I will argue, make landscape assemblages coalesce. Weeds, which shout challenges to stability, show us transformations in which landscape assemblages come together and fall apart. Second, I'll speculate about the dream of the stag itself. It mesmerizes, I'll argue, causing viewers to focus on the wild enchantments of interior self-making. Interior wildness, in turn, makes landscape histories disappear. Landscape appear without history and with the completeness and coherence of a theater backdrop. <coughs> this is no way to know landscapes, especially the weedy landscapes we share with red deer stags. But first, let me show you the dream of the stag in action. Follow me. Look over my shoulder, but please be quiet. I'm walking as silently as I can along the forest path. My companion is a hunter, a landowner, a financial genius in the Danish garment business. He's gained and lost more money in a few minutes than farmers make in several years. I'll call him the bull to mark his barrel chest, his aristocratic aspirations, and his continuing search not just for gain, but also for rising markets, the ones we call full. As the evening approaches, we reach a hunting high seat and climb up. In Denmark, individual hunting is done from high seats so that a hunter can safely aim for ground at the end of his shot. American-style stalking is illegal. High seats must not have roofing or too comfortable seats. The bull and I perch precariously on the board and protected from view, peer over the side. We're looking onto a large grassy meadow surrounded by dense plantation groves of pine and spruce. The red deer hide in the forest during the day, but at dusk they come out to feed. Shooting is allowed only until sunset, so we have a short window of time. We peer anxiously into the evening. This time, we don't have too long to wait. A hind peeks out from the forest, looks around, and leads her two companions into the meadow. One is another hind, the third is a young buck, perhaps two or three years old. It's late October, and the hinds are already pregnant. They've spread out without contest by the stags. Only this, I'm told, allows this young buck to hang out with hinds. They eat peacefully, too far away for a shot. Our watching, too, is relaxed and peaceful. Then an older hind enters from the other side of the open space. She's leading a large group of hinds and calves and a big stag with a rack of antlers. The bull is riveted, his grip ready as he stares at the stag through the side of his gun. It's much too far away to shoot, but that doesn't stop his fascination. The other riveted one is the young buck. He stares. He approaches with his head high. The stag looks up from eating. Buck is less than a third his size, hardly. Threat. The stag waves his antlers for a moment and then goes back to eating. But young Buck is mesmerized. He stands, he raises his head, he eases back a step, but then urges himself to step forward. And Bull, too, mesmerized. He does not want to shoot kinds and calves. It's the stag that draws him, or perhaps in both cases, the dream of the stag. I'm interested in these asymmetrical gazes. The stag does not look at either buck or bull, and bull, buck and bull do not look at each other. Each stares at the stag. What are they seeing and not seeing? And how does the entanglement of their respective non-entanglements shape the landscape? Both things interest me, their non-engagement with each other and the emergent landscape assemblage that's made possible despite that. The coordination between these two non-meeting stairs, the unintentional work of the dream of the stag, is key to the weedy dynamics of this play. The presence of red deer here is already strange. 
Red Deer were Ice Age residents in Jutland, but the Danish king succeeded in exterminating Jutland's Red Deer, except for a few in private game parks in the 18th century. Furthermore, Jutland has become more and more tame, especially since 19th and 20th century <coughs> industrial techniques allowed the conversion of moorland into modern farms. Other than road verges and hedgerows, one can hardly find a square meter of non-agro-industrial space. The trees are plantation crops, the soils are augmented with fertilizers. It takes an abandoned mind to host a scene of wildness. That's why the place is interesting for the oral research team. It turns out that many nature reserves and parks across northern Europe are abandoned mines or other sites of human-made ruin. But our field site is not a park. Red deer wandered in by themselves, along with an array of surprising guests, including invasive non-natives, such as raccoon dogs, as well as the deeply prohibited wild boar, and most recently, the scary and thrilling wolves. What a diverse menagerie to have assembled itself. I've been thinking of this kind of reassemblage as auto-rewilding. Rewilding refers to the placement of animals in human-disturbed landscapes, whether to aid ecosystem services or merely to enhance biodiversity. Auto-rewilding, then, would be the rewilding activities of animals themselves. And I might include plants and other organisms as auto-rewilders, too. Auto-rewilding is one of the most important processes for making our human-disturbed world. Without auto rewilding, our disturbed landscapes would be thin and bare, <laughs> devoid of organisms except those we put there. But auto rewilding offers ambivalent futures. On the one hand, we owe the richness of our feral landscapes to auto rewilding. On the other, auto rewilders often kill the chances of other less aggressive and disturbance loving species. Auto rewilders are bold, they are weedy. Like us, they do not play well with others. They help us make the Anthropocene, the proposed epic of outsized human disturbance. We ought to know something about auto rewilders, but Anthropocene scholars have been more interested in engineered human spaces than weeds. The problem is not the dream of the stag. In fact, it's something like its converse, the lure of universal history, which denies the presence of diverse landscapes altogether. Geologists introduced the term Anthropocene. Global and universal time is their gift from the Enlightenment, and they're not about to give it up. Anthropologists might differ, since heterogeneity is our gift. For us, Anthropocene gains traction only when we combine time and space by making landscapes units of analysis. Besides, landscapes are necessary to see weedy configurations. I turn to landscape then as a tool that might revitalize Anthropocene discussions and bring us back to auto rewilding. For most of the last 25 years, anthropologists have been wary of studying landscapes. This is because we follow cultural geographers into anxiety about one of the word landscapes genealogies, that genealogy that takes us into Dutch landscape painting, the picturesque and the reification of nature as an object of enlightenment vision. From the perspective of that genealogy, to study landscape is to flatten our perspectives to notice only the distant view. Alas, this put landscapes many other delights off limits. I'm grateful to geographer Kenneth Olby for taking us beyond this impasse. Olby argues that an earlier and more pertinent ge genealogy of landscape in Germanic Europe is that place in which political moots could be gathered to discuss things, that is, issues of importance. A landscape is a gathering in the making. I like this definition. It lends itself to many of the problems to which landscape studies can be addressed. Landscapes are simultaneously imaginative and material. They encompass physical geographies, phenomenologies, and cultural and political commitments. The definition can be extended, too, to encompass multi-species gatherings in the making. My landscapes are moose in which all kinds of living beings, and non-vital things, too, such as rocks and water, take part. They come together to negotiate collaborative survival, the who lives and who dies, and the who stays and who goes enactments of the landscape. They may not notice each other directly. They may ignore each other, like the buck and the bull. 
but each declines or flourishes in the effects of the world-making projects initiated and maintained by the others. Landscapes, then, are gatherings of ways of being in the making. As ecologists argue, they're units of heterogeneity. A landscape can exist at any scale as long as it encompasses heterogeneous patches. There are landscapes on a leaf and on a continent. The so-called landscape scale of GIS is only one of many scales for landscapes worth exploring. And ways of being? Ways of being are historically shifting enactments. Species is relevant, but hardly fully determinate. A farmer and a financier have different human enactments. So too, a racehorse and a plow horse have different horse enactments. Rocks and water also have historically shifting ways of being. In landscape moves, ways of being emerge and shape what's possible for all the others. Landscapes are historical, and they allow us to think across a variety of scales from deep time to current events. Such shifting scales of time are the focus of discussion about the Anthropocene, a term that continues to be contested and is thus still open. How might we bring landscape into Anthropocene? In the next section, my challenge is to let landscape interrupt Anthropocene universal histories, both by taking those timelines seriously and by showing how they look different when used to peek at particular landscapes. Landscapes interrupt history. This allows me to come back later to let history interrupt landscapes, or at least the kind that arise in the spell of the stag. What are we to do with Anthropocene timelines? Timelines need not propose epochal shifts. They can also offer points from which to watch for something new. Think of them, perhaps, like the hunting high seat in my slide. They're sites, moments, and events from which our awareness of landscape transformations might be heightened. Consider, for example, the key dates at play for the beginning of the Anthropocene. These dates are competing entries, but here I make them points for noticing landscape change. Archaeologists have suggested that the Anthropocene should begin 10,000 years ago with the very first plant and animal domestication. Geographers argue for 1610, a global CO2 drop that can be explained by the genocide of Native Americans by European-introduced diseases. <clears throat> genocide encouraged forced regrowth in the New World, lowering global CO2 and perhaps explaining the latter half of the Little Ice Age in Europe. Climate scientists first promoted 1880s as the start date for the Anthropocene because of the Industrial Revolution. But now they've turned their attention to 1945, the first atom bomb, with its clear radioactive signature in sediments around the world and the great acceleration of human population and industrial disturbance. If these states are high seats from which to notice human innovations, they're also high seats from which to notice the making of new kinds of weeds. Consider the weediness, each of the innovations noticed by Anthropocene scholars <coughs> into the definition, oops, sorry, into the world. The domestication of plants and animals brings weeds of crops and livestock from rats to the plants that hide in the grain as barley did in the wheat. There are weeds too of disturbed field edges, plants and animals that thrive with human disturbance. There are new diseases for humans and their domestic animals as pathogens pass back and forth in the crowded conditions of domestic life. Measles and smallpox are examples. These forms of weediness come into the world and stay with us. The European conquest of the new world offers a whole other catalog of weeds. I like historian Virginia Anderson's term creatures of empire, by which she means the livestock brought by European settlers, which through their wandering, eating, and property status, helped destroy Native Americans, human and non-human. But the term might be extended to consider the whole suite of species that travels with conquering humans. First, there are those I call shock troops, that is, those that help humans make the conquest. In the New World, European pathogens did that first work, livestock followed them. 
But they're also what I think, I think of as camp followers, the suite of intentionally and non-intentionally introduced organisms that made life more difficult for natives, human and not human. Think of starlings, first introduced to the US to commemorate Shakespeare's birds, now spread across the continent, displacing native birds. These are creatures of human invasion. The Industrial Revolution rationalized landscapes for capitalist asset making. Several kinds of weediness were born from this rationalization. Pests and pathogens, for example, proliferated and emerged in new, more virulent kinds from the crowded monocrops of rationalized farming. Chemical fertilizers allowed industrial farming to proliferate, and the massive use of fertilizer ran off into waterways, ruining them for fish and water plants. These are feral landscapes from inside agricultural rationalization. And inside, however, there were survivors, such as the remnant American prairie grasses described by historian William Cronin. These grasses came to live only on railroad verges where sparks lit fires and no one regulated the results. Weediness reaches to embrace both terrifying and hopeful ecology. The post-World War II Great Acceleration has also been an acceleration of feral landscapes. Industrial capitalism moved to the most remote spots on Earth to use and then quickly abandon them as sites for asset production. Feral landscapes replaced not just the last wilderness areas, but also the last peasant ecologies with their comparatively long-term accommodations between humans and non-humans. Meanwhile, toxins proliferate and slow degrading anthropogenic substances such as plastics scatter everywhere. Every feral landscape of dynamic, every feral landscape dynamic layers forms of weediness brought into being at varied historical moments. Take auto rewilding. Auto rewilders are disturbance loving and disturbance making. The weeds of crops and livestock are talented auto rewilders. Auto rewilders are weedy invaders, drawing agilities from both ancient and modern conquests. Auto rewilders are survivors in non rationalized edge spaces. An abandoned industrial site is an edge made large. Auto rewilders make use of the acceleration of industrial use and abandonment. The numbing speed of capital's mobility makes auto rewilding the best agility we have for survival, as well as a terrifying mess. <coughs> By agilities, I mean ways of being that emerge from historical opportunities, where earlier thinkers imagined only mechanical repetition among our humans. I'm looking for emerging talents. Auto rewilders have lots. Even where auto rewilders are blocked, they may be lying in wait to seize the time. Because of these layered agilities, the high seats I've identified for noticing weedy development do not tell a historical story in themselves. Instead, they call out for stories of particular landscapes told in multiple time and space scales. In those stories, we can watch agilities, which though they emerge from different times and places, assemble for a definitive effect in the friction of landscape. In the next section of my talk, I offer a thumbnail history of the Sufi brown coal beds. Not the coal, which comes much earlier, but of human habitation since the end of the last ice age. Several kinds of auto rewilding agilities have developed on this multiply disturbed anthropogenic landscape. I'll narrate three landscape assemblages, each of which condenses human and non-human histories in an emergent cohesion of the multi-species moot. The more, the mind, and the mess. Such histories are the Anthropocene in action timelines interrupted by landscape. During the last ice age, the Sufi brown coal fields narrowly escaped being covered by glaciers. If you can find Denmark in this image, notice the sliver of western Denmark that somehow remained free of glaciers. Instead, however, it was completely covered with sand and gravel, glacial outwash, the result of glacial movement without being of the glacier. Humans moved north as the glaciers receded. I couldn't help uh, not put, putting this in this slide of our 
artist's imagination of that time because it has the dream of the staff in the high middle of the picture drawing the hunters on. As this slide shows too, trees followed the retreating glaciers, and not just birch, as shown here, but pine and lime and oak. Jutland is known for its comparatively late Neolithic, but eventually humans cut down those trees, and since they were growing on sandy glacial outwash, they took their time growing back. In their slowness, they were overtaken by another landscape assemblage, the moor. Humans did not engineer the moor, but they helped make it. As you can see from this painting, humans had companions in sheep and heather. This is a 19th century painting showing grazing intensification for the earlier period, imagine it as an hatch. What's missing here is fire, another participant in this gathering of ways of being. Without burning and grazing, the trees come back. The moor is a feral landscape of domestication. Uh, gathering historical agilities of humans, sheep, heather, and fire. I'm not sure if you can see it, but this painting also shows knitting, a long-standing livelihood activity of the peasants who lived on the moor, and one that through the twists and turns of fiber led to the continuing importance of the textile and garment industry in central Jutland. The, the peasant, if, if you can see, is actually knitting. Here then, my stories must enter the intertwined histories of textiles on the one hand and juggling ecologies on the other. It's not fortuitous that my character, Bull, is a garment industry king. Changes in the organization of textile and garment <coughs> production go a long way in shaping the very weedy landscapes that have congealed in Sufi. But let me take each Anthropocene dateline one by one. Back when peasants occupied the moor, every shepherd had his wool knitting and knitted garments became not just a local specialty, but also an item of trade. By the 17th century, wool traders from central Jutland were selling their products in Copenhagen, and when Copenhagen traders complained, the king even gave them special licenses. 1610 is my second Anthropocene high seat to look out on weedy ecologies. What do we see? Despite advances in the wool trade, Jutland, including Subi, had become extraordinarily backward in the mud, as it were. Scholars have paid considerable attention to the asymmetrical ecological effects of 16th and 17th century European conquest. Compared to Americans, Europeans were lucky. The flow of invasive species at that time was going mainly the other way. However, consider the spread of European influence towards Asia. The whole point of funding exploration, both west and east, was to position European traders to get Indian cottons and Chinese silks without the mediation of Muslims, who Christian Europeans had learned to despise. In 1600 and 1602, respectively, the British and Dutch East India companies were formed with their gunboats and wealthy investors. By 1610, Europeans had a presence in the Asia trade. In 1664 alone, the British East India Company imported a million pieces of calico and chintz. The result in Jutland? Wool was no longer exciting to urban elites, who could suddenly buy colorful cotton and silk. Jutland's moors dozed unmolested and mixed with oak scrub as European metropoles looked elsewhere for their riches. Slavery, colonialism, and the Industrial Revolution, the dynamic developments of Europe, came into being through the search for cotton, not wool. The sustainability of the Moor's weedy ecology was a side effect of the trade in cotton and silk, which allowed wool production to molder in backwaters such as central Jutland. Only later would wool production be modernized. The Industrial Revolution is my next high seat, and indeed Jutland was transformed in the mid-19th century but it had a lot to do with the war. <coughs> After Denmark lost its most fertile farmlands to Prussia, Danes dedicated themselves to the modernization of Jutland, saying, what was lost without will be gained within. Chemical fertilizers and machines that could break the moor's iron pan made it possible to plant crops and tree plantations and to raise dairy cattle and pigs. But the area I'm discussing was saved from that. Sheep grazing remained and indeed intensified. 
a different modernization was at hand. Those wool merchants I mentioned with 17th century rights had been keeping up with the times. They introduced knitting machines and a putting out system for wool <coughs> garments. Knitting scaled up, no longer left in the hands of individual peasants. Serious money could be made, enough to become capital. By the early 20th century, textile and garment entrepreneurs were importing cotton to add to their businesses. Note that Danish, like English, uses the French word entrepreneur to praise businessmen as those who make things happen. From the first, these garment and textile entrepreneurs were a close-knit group tied by kinship, marriage, and personal favors. They were also what we now call flexible. In other words, they moved capital around from one business sector to another. This is one way to understand why some invested in brown coal during World War II. The Domkoff family had three notable brothers raised in textiles, Aurel, Maas, and Knut. When World War II came along, it was Knut who moved back and forth from brown coal mining at Subiu to textile production. He also continued to work closely with his textile industry brothers starting a textile high school, among other things. Not all the investment in brown coal mining came from the regional textile and garment industry. Entrepreneurs arrived from all over Denmark. But the regional commitments of this industry have laid continuing sediments on the landscape, even in its disruptions. We have arrived at World War II, my next high seat for weedy landscapes. And what a time it was at Subiu, where everything was turned upside down in the most literal sense. The war had cut Denmark off from its British coal supplies. Some politicians tried to protect Danes from being conscripted into Germany. The poor wall farmers were delighted to sell their land to entrepreneurs. The net result of this conjuncture was a make-work program of shoveling for one of the world's most inefficient and dirty fuels, brown coal. Great holes were dug and drained. Sand piles and acid lakes were left behind. This is a good landscape to think about auto rewilding precisely because the former ecosystem was wiped out. Here's what the landscape looked like in 1970 when the mining was abandoned. Here's the same area in 2000. Not all of this forest is self-seeded, although some of it is. After 1958, brown coal companies were required to put funds in the Landscape Rehabilitation Fund and it was used for tree planting, particularly with fast-growing exotic conifers, such as American Lodge Pole. Lodge Pole turned out to be a great auto rewilder. It took off across the landscape, and now landowners battle unsuccessfully to cut it down. It also invited all kinds of animals, including red deer, who showed up for the first time in 1985. That brought hunters who bought up the land and fought against development, citing, citing the instability of the sand piles left by mining with their proneness to sudden collapse. With management for hunting, other animals moved in. Daring auto rewilders took over. Fed by the hunters, red deer proliferated like rabbits. But let me go back to the textile and garment industry for a moment. After the war, the industry rationalized and boomed. Then came the end of the Cold War. Former Soviet states became much cheaper places to make textiles and garments. Our entrepreneurs were ready with their flexibility. They outsourced all production and specialized in design and innovation and hauling in the capital. Business analysts think of them as great models. They have lots of money and lots of time. They invest in modern art and hunting. They push others out of their hunting grounds, thus encouraging the red deer. Red deer keep down the plants, making the landscape useless for farms or tree plantations. Together, Hunters and red deer create a particular kind of weediness. I return then to the dream of the stag. The histories I've told help me read how the dream of the stag enchants at Subi. For the bull, hunting has something to do with playing with money. Each tests his mettle, each develops his drive. Hunting also draws government ministers and CEOs into his network. He invites them to his hunt thus augmenting financial flexibility, another kind of freedom. As he explained, he isn't interested in shooting for meat. If he kills, he lets someone else do the butchering. Besides, the autumn stags he prefers are so rank that no one much wants to eat them. 
It's his confrontation with the great male, the, perhaps the father, which is at stake. So too for the buck who looks at the father with the urge to fight. The buck, like the bull, is a historical figure, a bundle of congealed agilities in this moment of auto-rewilding. He stands there in preparation. He is grooming himself to steal the herd and to inseminate the hinds. While the hinds can be said to lead the herd, they lead it for food and safety. The bucks, in contrast, are the masters of reproduction and expansion. In this protected zone, the landscape assemblage I've called the mess. There's room for lots of male pretension and fighting, more than in a stable ecology. Herds can spread and reproduce, males search for new wild corners. Just as for the bull, for the buck, this is a historical time for ferocity and freedom. The dream of the stag thus acts as an axis of coordination between the projects of the buck and the bull. Without much notice between the two, they find themselves with overlapping projects of world making. Through such overlaps, a landscape emerges. Lots of other organisms, as well as non vital stuff, occupy this landscape. But every time even a small coordination emerges, a moment of friction, if you will, it has landscape making effects. It gives the assemblage at least a momentary trajectory. The feral menagerie of the soapy brown coal fields, from wolves to lodgepole pines, owes a lot to this moment of coordination between the projects of red deer and financial entrepreneurs, the buck and the bull. All landscapes are made in such moments of friction. This is why we need both human and non-human history to know them. The coordination between red deer and hunters encourages a particular kind of weedy landscape. It also blocks out others. This is the message of nature writer George Mumbayat's recent book, Feral, An Exploration of the Possibilities of Rewilding. Several chapters take readers to Scotland, an, ex an excellent analog for the central Jutland site I've been describing. Red deer hunters own huge tracts of land there, and red deer and hunters together encourage a certain kind of weediness. Indeed, or our team member, Matilda Hoyer's research has followed the Central Jetland nex nexus there. One landowner is a Central Jetland garment magnet, and he brings Jetland style hunting to Scotland. Mumbai doesn't like the landscape of red deer and hunter landowners. He sees another weedy landscape waiting at the gates, excluded. If you fence off even a small area so that the deer can't get to it, he shows, a forest begins to emerge. Oaks and pines are auto rewilders just waiting for a different set of coordinations to allow them to come back. Mumbai argues for the advantage of this set of weeds in the waiting. They encourage a much larger suite of animals. They restore some of the floral ri richness of the place. Every landscape coordination blocks out other coordinations. Every weed that takes over excludes others. This is a useful caution. Without calling it by name, Mumbai ties exclusion to the dream of the stag. He mentions the British painting, Monarch of the Glen, which shows a Scottish red deer stag with vague wild mountains behind him. The landscape cannot be the focus because the hunting coordination disallows it. Mumbai condemns the dream of the stag for blacking the richness of other coordinations. The dream of the stag is a form of self-absorption in which other enabling entanglements are forgotten. One coordination mesmerizes, other landscape assemblages disappear. What if we take this insight into theoretical territory? There's an irony here I want to probe. To be enchanted by the dream of the stag is to care about non-humans, but only to be caught in the erasure of landscape assemblage. How can our very best thinkers about multi-species relations yet return again and again to human exceptionalism and landscapes made entirely by human dreams and schemes? Perhaps one place to begin is with unrepentant human exceptionalism, the kind that explicitly excludes non-humans as outside the charmed circle of world making. My reading of The Dream of the Stag makes me sympathetic to this stance, even as I disagree. Here, other humans take the place of the stag. The theorist is mesmerized by the dream of the human. In, thinking, in limiting focus to this one enchanting antagonist, 
since then, other, entangle other entanglements are erased. Human self-making, rather than multi-species coordination, takes over the analysis. The enchanted, the en I'm sorry, my throat's really dry. The enhanced agilities of the viewer caught in the dream of the human block out the life world histories that make the dream possible. <coughs> From here, it seems easy to alight on philosopher Martin Heidegger, that astonishing thinker about language being and dwelling as agilities of humans. In his focus on the dream of the human, however, he excludes all others. And at least he has the courage to say so. Consider his famous claim that animals are poor in the world. This statement would reduce my buck's gaze to instinct as an animal to Heidegger, the buck only has its inherited sensory sphere. It cannot develop agilities or make worlds. Humans alone are world makers. Yet consider how this is a reflex of how Heidegger defines world, which for him requires language as logos, a particular human proclivity. If we define world from a deer's proclivities, humans would be poor in the world. Heidegger is focused on human, the animal, is collateral damage. But watch how this blocks the history of landscape assemblages. The animal is instinctive, that is mechanical. It has no history. For history to Heidegger is made in the meaning space of language. The animal is ahistorical because it does not live with language. Thus animals have no historical projects to coordinate with humans. The mise-en-scene of human life, the landscape, must be entirely human-made. Heidegger offers an exceptionally clear statement of the dream of the human, which catches us in its enchantment, blinding us to others. Indeed, late in his life, he moved away from this stance, thus making his earlier position clearer. It's as if my buck was there. Heidegger shows us the gaze of a deer, albeit a deer in a poem. The lines between human and deer become blurred in the face of their common mortality. The dream of the deer, ironically, releases him from the dream of the human. From here, it's not too large a step to anthropologists working on alternative ontologies. Consider those with the strongest critiques of the West, that is, theorists of radically different ways to do worlds. I'm full of excitement and respect for this move, which has woken anthropology from a long doze. And yet, isn't it a branch of human exceptionalism? This might be a shocking claim. Lots of non-humans are key figures of concern, from jaguars to shaman snuff bottles. Yet these non-humans do not have their own ontologies. They're brought into being by humans. Only humans have ontologies. Only humans make worlds. Only humans make landscapes. The major exception of which I'm aware is Eduardo Cohn, although even Cohn makes communication the sine qua non of being an almost Heideggerian move. I tend to agree that only humans have ontologies. Ontologies are philosophies of being, and it's not clear to me that any organisms other than humans bother with philosophy. Yet perhaps the situation changes when we consider Helen Varan's term, ontics. Ontics are not philosophies, but practices in which modes of being are enacted. Anyone can do ontics, whether or not they're interested in philosophy. A deer, a plant, a stone, all have ontics, even though they don't have ontologies. Furthermore, ontics are humbler than ontologies. They don't demand to take up all the space. Most thinkers about ontology divide the world in contrasts. There's ontology A and ontology B, and ne'er the twain shall meet. Ontics, in contrast, touch overlap, work around each other, layer, and mutate in each other's presence. <coughs> there are axes of coordination as well as refusals. Looking at landscape emergence is a matter of ontics. It's the coordination between the ontics of the bull and the buck, rather than their coherence in a single cosmology that offers a powerful trajectory to landscape history. Landscape assemblages arise in the juxtaposition of varied modes of making worlds. No single cosmology can order a landscape alone. So why has it been so easy to ignore this point? The dream of the stag, or the jaguar, or the west, 
enchants viewers to enhance their own agilities in the chase while neglecting the coordinations that make this possible. The landscape blurs, and the only non-humans that can be seen are those that occupy the space of the dream, the space of the chase. You might be thinking that I'm working towards a plug for natural science, but I'm not. When it comes to the dream of the stag, stories of science can be just as bad as stories of cosmology. Let me return to Monbiot's Pharaoh as exemplar. When I first read that book, I couldn't get to the ecological insights because I was so disturbed by the frame. The premise of the book is that rewilding begins in the heart of the self, and while masculinity is never mentioned directly, it's clear that that's what's intended. Rewilding to my bias means putting oneself into dangerous situations on purpose in order to cultivate an imagined intimacy with wild animals and primitive people. By imagined here, I mean fantasized. My bias intimacy with these others is limited by the fact that this is a project for building the self. It's the wild interiority of the masculine self that best promotes the feral, he tells us. This is not about relationships or coordinations but about individuals who find their feral selves. As Mumbai puts it, describing how good it feels to carry a dead deer he found in the woods over his shoulders, civilization slips off one's shoulders like a bathrobe. One is left with one's inner animal. Despite Mumbai's dislike of red deer hunting, this is the dream of a stag. Mumbai's immersion in multi-species landscapes is eclipsed by self-making, which erases other agendas. Again, the dream of the stag helps me be sympathetic, even as I disagree. It helps me put Mumbai's chase in the context of his antagonist, the ones he calls civilization. Consider the public intellectuals of Anthropocene discussion. A powerful gang has grown up to advocate the good Anthropocene. That is the one that can be controlled and exploited by familiar civilizational tools. I think of these voices as the inheriting sons of Anthropocene thought. They are the ones who use the master's tools to refurbish the master's house, the eco-modernists. <clears throat> Their tools are capitalism, canonical philosophy, and elite technology. They tell us that these tools can fix what's broken in the environment. They don't worry about weeds. Like other social engineers before them, they tell us that nothing will go wrong with their plans. They don't care about the dream of the stag. They just want to inherit the property. In contrast to these guys, Mumbaiat is a rebellious son. Here he joins other rebellious, uh, he sees the problem of civilization. He develops his will to resist the mandate of the father. Here he joins other rebellious sons, heroes, pirates, loners. They immerse themselves in wild places to sop up their wildness. They hope that the sheer strength of their newly established selfhood will conquer civilization. Yet they're limited by the dream of the stag. They don't care to notice the entanglements and coordinations that take them there. It's hard not to imagine that they're just trying to escape from the wife and kids. If we want to take the Anthropocene seriously, even through description, we must do better than either of those two masculine alternatives inheritors and rebels. The Anthropocene, I've argued, is an invitation to pay attention to weeds. So many of us are Anthropocene weeds. Weeds are creatures of disturbance. We make use of opportunities, climb over others, and form collaborations with those who allow us to proliferate. The key task is to figure out which kinds of weediness allow landscapes of more than human livability. This requires history at many scales. That's the Aura Field Site, an unremarkable ruined place in the boring center of Denmark. I've argued that any ruined place can provoke stories of weedy assemblage for the last 10,000 years or the last 10 years. Through attention to the coordinations that allow particular weedy assemblages, landscape can be a research object that shows us the heterogeneity of world-making projects to watch the dream of the stag and yet attend to coordinations that hunters ignore. We need to make histories of landscape that involve all kinds of beings, human and not human. 
lest too we can take up a central analytic challenge of thinking Anthropocene, how to combine landscape and history such that difference and possibility remain in sight. I know it's a form of insanity to throw so many kinds of different materials into the same presentation, but at least it should give you something to chew on. I would be honored and delighted if we could spend the next few minutes in a discussion about what varied approaches to landscape <laughs> do. Please do not be shy. I want to hear your questions and comments, and even more, I want to engage with your ways of knowing landscape. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for the very interesting speech. I, and I now open the, door, the floor for the discussion. So I will have three questions first. And uh, please raise your hands. Introduce yourself and this one, two, six, seven, there in the middle. intrigued by the implications of weeds as, uh, in a way, leftovers, things that appear in gaps, and uh, uh, the, the <coughs> things that are left over or grow within uh, abandoned spaces and so on. And uh, why I'm interested in that, especially given what you've said there about the entanglement of things that don't uh, usually are not usually thought of as being together, is how to think about um, the possibility that of, of things running in parallel and not necessarily always having uh, mutual influence. And therefore, there's a, there's a kind of a multiplicity. And one of the ways that I've been trying to think about that is, is in terms of relation uh, rather than entities, uh, rather than thinking of a landscape as a thing thinking of it as a set of relations and not quite in the assemblage sense because the assemblage seems to always tend to have been singularity. So therefore, so how, how uh, still trying to articulate the question really, is how to think of what you're talking about here about the weed as something that might simultaneously have uh, relations to other things, the stag and, and the mind Same time running parallel, not necessarily touching. So it's 
uh, just drawing on this kind of um, mapping story, the simultaneity of stories so far, uh, that, that things can sometimes run in trajectories. Um, then there was one, you, yeah. Thank you. 
cancer issues. Okay. Uh, we have still time. Uh, there was a few things called up first. Maybe you can then, and then you were. Um, you were. inspiring uh, uh, presentation as usual. <laughs> I, uh, I share, you know, your anti-exceptionalism. Uh, however, I wonder how you get to know the antics of a stag or a, of a plant or whatever, uh, except by uh, working on the relationship between specific humans and specific stags in specific places, uh, the dream, the, the tools of ethology with the tools of ethnography and trying to build some kind of multi species ethnography, uh, we can perhaps reach some understanding of how they influence each other, how they share some things, how they may disagree or uh, be different or have different perspectives on other things. But uh, I really wonder how we get into the world of uh, uh, gender life. a bit on the um, uh, relationship of the wild, the, the notion of the wild and the human as well. Because I'm wondering what is the young wild or the less wild that kind of applies and if you say that something is really wild and um, Because it has to do with human impact, but then it's not only human impact, but more than human impact. So what criteria do you and your team use to, to define along the way where, where you say this is wild, more or less? One more there. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, this is fascinating. Um, my name is Ivan Casey. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, one about the concept of ordinary worlding or weakness. I wondered um, if perhaps it was slightly landscapes become totally transformed, for example, your primary example, which you followed by very powerful photographs of the forest. That forest, obviously forests can grow quite quickly within 10, 20, 10, 20, 30 years, but I don't think that they achieve the same levels of biodiversity as before, okay? And second, my second question, so that's in terms of the question of time and scale, and then my second question was concerns near the conclusion you kind of confronted with rebellious sounds. Okay? I wondered why there are lots of other people who have thought about these questions for a long time. I think of people like uh, Murray Bookchin, René Bois, people like this, who have offered very powerful alternatives for nearly 100 years, you know, 70 years or so. I wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for such interesting questions. Um, I'll start with Philippe uh, Descola's uh, question about how do we get at the objects of the stab or the world of the dandelion. Of course, I think you're completely correct that we only have our human uh, capabilities. And um, on the other hand, I think we can do more than anthropologists have in the past usually been willing that even that the kinds of, of participant observation that we feel comfortable doing with humans actually can take us somewhere with non-humans. Uh, that, and that when we add to that all the different kinds of knowledge of different kinds of human practices, whether they are local residents or of scientists, that whether they are uh, people who happen to spend a lot of time in those landscapes with those uh, creatures or people who have special tools to look at them in different ways, that these are all human capacities indeed, but just in the way that I think sometimes people tell us that other cultures are impenetrable, 
that we couldn't possibly understand something something in another culture and that anthropologists have kind of taken the, the idea that if you hang out for long enough and you try and come in at enough different angles, you start to learn something. And I think that's true for non-humans as well. And that I uh, know one kind of story is going to be enough, that we're going to need indeed uh, many kinds of storytelling about those creatures, as well as our own uh, attempts to get into the worlds in the best ways that we know how. Uh, to pay attention to what they're doing. I mean, I, you know, just even in my little story about, about the buck, I had, it, it wasn't, I mean, what I described actually happened, and I realized that I had seen something about that buck going back and forth, stepping back and forth, and that, uh, of course, then I tried to talk to some red deer, some, some, biologists in the area know a little bit more about red deer than I do. Uh, but combining those different kinds of sources and paying attention to them in terms of what those uh, folks are doing, I, I don't think, I think anthropologists have been too afraid of, of uh, entering the worlds of non-humans and that we can do a lot more than we have. So that's as far as I can get. I, I, uh, the, the wild and what is rewilding. Um, there, um, I have to start by saying that it's one of those terms uh, that's become a movement. So I didn't make up the term rewilding, and so I'm responding to somebody else's term. And a term that's become, it, while being quite polysemic in itself, uh, I have to be carried along what others are wanting. So uh, you're completely right. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting to me about reading that Monbiot book about his opinions about Scotland, he doesn't like the red deer. Well, the rewilding biologists that are part of the Danish scene, they love the red deer. They want more grazing, and the Scottish want less grazing. And uh, so there's lots of disagreements about what rewilding should be and what creatures uh, should involve and, and what kind of landscapes you want and uh, back to the thing that we're about to talk about, about what kinds of biodiversity um, are going to be. So it's extremely contested. Okay, uh, I do not think auto rewilding solves all the problems of the world. This is back to that question about the weeds. I, I think um, we can't ignore it but it's absolutely true that we're in the middle of a great extinction crisis and that all of the kinds of organisms that we're losing are an incredible loss. We do not know whether we'll be able to get along without those. It's not just that some obscure kind of frog is dying, that whole ecosystems may no longer function because of the things that we're letting die. So I'm with you completely, and uh, one of all, I, I think we ought to know something about those weedy species, but I don't think they're solving the problems of the world. So you're completely right. And as for your other comment, I agree also completely. I wanted to draw attention to, to uh, partly I was trying really hard to do as sympathetic a reading as I could to the kind of rebellious sons thing, because where I agree with them, is that the eco-modernists are not helping us. Uh, so that's why I wanted to put those two in there and look at their confrontation with each other. But you are completely right. We are very lucky that there are other approaches to doing this that we need to be tapping. Okay, uh, there's still time for more questions and I think I saw one hand earlier. There's one here and one here. There are more, and third there, so please finish the hunt. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. My name is Martin Krishnamurthy. I teach at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, India. I was wondering if you could expand on the question of the masculinity narrative that you 
sort of entered air. And I was thinking, especially when you look at the bad inheritors of the Anthropocene, the rebellious sons of the eco-modernists, if there was something from this strand of feminist eco-criticism that speaks about engagement, entanglement, rather than these forms of war station that you could expand for. What is the question of gendering that sort of underlies the narrative that we haven't spoken much about? Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, you are. Yeah. And, uh, thanks a lot for the talk, first talk from Tallinn University. I wanted to ask about um, the Anthropocene term. That's the question we haven't had yet. So here it comes. Um, it's a uh, tension, and I'm struggling to, uh, I'm struggling with as well, which is the term it draws a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, productive discussion. But then when we talk about it quite often, it seems to be a continuation of what we've been hearing from environmental historians for 30 years. And you cited uh, Phil Cronin, probably best known in anthropological circles, who talked about um, changes in vegetation, and this is exactly what he's been talking about. So, what is specific about the Anthropocene? Is it, why is it not just environmental history? Thank you very much for that. My name is Chiara Ambrosi, I'm a filmmaker. I, I couldn't stop thinking of the British writer J.G. Ballard throughout your whole talk and how in many ways it seems like you're talking about the possibility that thinking about um, uh, weedy, weedy landscapes and um, um, new, new relationships as a way of um, of transforming the, the narrative and the way in which you talk about something, and the way in which, for example, you talked about how Heidegger's uh, conception shifted when he when he started talking about the gaze of the deer, for example, and I was wondering how, perhaps, knowing what you're talking about, that it is important to know weedy landscapes. It's important to talk about it, and potentially the the. the the power that it may have in transforming the the perspective from which you talk about asking about the narratives that are written about it and um, yeah just that. I'm, I'm not sure if you, not sure I understood what the question part is or if it's more of a comment. Same way, for example, um, in which Ballard's way of talking about cities or uh, you know the, the certain landscapes that he describes transform your understanding of society right now. So the potential that thinking about landscape this way can have. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll start with that. I, now that I think I get it, which is yes, I think uh, the minute we realize that we are. I, I, Let's put it this way, you know, when it, for those of us who live in cities, uh, all kinds of infrastructures are out there to make us forget that we live in landscapes. To, that to think that food grows in grocery stores and that, you know, the air we breathe is just kind of naturally there and, um, you know, that germs are an invasion, that everything around us conspires for that. And the minute you start thinking about these multi-species entanglements, you can't live that way anymore. That suddenly, you're always surrounded by the enabling entanglements of landscape that are with us, whether we ever go to the countryside or not, to notice, you know, where does our food come from and things like that. So, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know Ballard's work, but you've given me someone to look into. The masculinity there, to thank you for noticing that. Uh, I think, I do think uh, it's one of the interesting challenges for me to think about uh, whether there's a, a necessary feminist theory intervention into the kinds of discussions about Anthropocene and environmental crisis that we've been done. So this is kind of beginning work in my 
part to try and get there, to think about what kinds of feminist criticism might be useful in doing a better job of uh, imagining the entanglements that we're a part of. So I'm not sure I can get farther in the way that you wanted me to, but I think it's really important. I, I mean, the only other insight I've had is that you know one of the big criticisms of the term anthropocene uh, is that it uh, kind of makes puts this enlightenment <laughs> man back as if uh, he was in charge of everything, and rather than not wanting to use the word for that reason, I think we ought to be exploring that. You know, who is this Enlightenment man guy, and uh, how is he implicated in some of the kinds of environmental uh, problems that we've got going? So I think there's important work for feminist theorists to be doing uh, in this Anthropocene world, and we're just at the beginning, as far as I know, in getting going and doing that work, so thanks for noticing it. Anthropocene, uh, is it new? Uh, is it just a kind of environmental history? I think what's the reason I'm willing to use this word Anthropocene, despite all its problems, is um, that natural scientists brought this up. This came out of the, the uh, geologists and the chemists, and suddenly they want to have an interdisciplinary discussion. I think that's very exciting. Uh, that article about 1610 is the beginning of the Anthropocene was published in Nature. And it was by geographers, that's a kind of crossover field like anthropology, but it combined materials on uh, carbon dioxide levels, uh, the kind of thing that natural scientists could really read, with world systems theory and deep histories, and was asking these natural scientists to take a look at kinds of historical materials that they normally didn't. That's the most interesting part about the Anthropocene discussion to me, is that it's requiring a new kind of engagement across disciplines, uh, still very much tentative. So it's not like it's firmed up into a clear uh, way of doing things. But there's something there that seems to me worth hanging in for when geologists are reading uh, what the historians have been up to. Uh, at, at least there is, so we have still time for one round. Okay, sure. That's it. Mm -hmm. I see Thea there, one and two. And maybe that's it, so two questions more. Thank you. 
different fields of discussion that prompt science to feminism and uh, all kinds of things, has started a little project that she calls Make Kin Not Babies, in which she wants to bring up again these questions of how do we talk about the number of humans there are on Earth in a way that still is full of respect for women's reproductive rights and other kinds of concerns that have blocked that conversation. So I'm hopeful that a new conversation can arise. But for many years, I think, no one's been able to talk about it at all because we can't think of how to do so. So you've uh, pressed a, a sore place and one that I think needs a lot of work uh, for the future. I only missed one question, so okay, probably sure. we can still have, okay. okay. okay sure. Kirsten, yes. wanted 
to think together about the kinds of work on landscape that we're doing at ARS. So that's an example kind of from the arts and humanities. Uh, I, I do think that the Anthropocene discussion, the only reason, despite the many, many flaws in that word Anthropocene, the only thing that's interesting about it is that it has gotten this good discussion going from across um, many kinds of backgrounds. Uh, yeah, so I can't think of anything I would exclude, in fact, uh, as part of it, that people come from many walks of life and have gotten interested in this, and that's what makes it worthwhile to continue the discussion. I'll say one other thing before closing that I know the conference organizers were worried that no one would ask any questions, and <laughs> I'm really grateful that for the great questions that you asked and what seems to me that we've started an interesting discussion that I hope will continue throughout the conference. So thank you. Thank you. Now you have a lunch time from 12 to 1.30, so the panels start at 